Okay. This is the Vietnam War interview, veteran interview, conducted by Liam Grogan. The interviewee is Sterling Grogan. This is being conducted on April 1st, 2022. It is 11.18 a.m. Eastern Time and is being conducted in a virtual Zoom meeting platform. Sterling Mike Grogan was born to Eddie and Grace Grogan in Redding, California in 1943. He spent the majority of his childhood with his father, mother, and older brother, Noel Grogan, in parts of Mexico and California. He attended high school in San Luis Obispo, California. Sterling then attended California Polytechnic University and pursued a degree in what is now political science. While in college, he was made aware of his eligibility for the Peace Corps and promptly joined. He served with the Peace Corps from 1964 to 1966 where he became fluent in Portuguese and learned some Italian. After two years in Brazil, he was drafted into the army to serve in Vietnam, even though he strongly opposed the US involvement in Indochina. Despite being signed on for an additional two years to the Peace Corps, Sterling was flown out of Brazil by commercial air to his initial point of entry at Fort Polk, California, uh, Louisiana. He received basic training from December of 1966 to February of 1967. Advanced individual training from February to April of 1967. Armored personnel carrier uh, drive training from May to June of 1967. Vietnamese language study from August 1967 to September 1968. And PSYOPs training from August to September of 1968. He arrived in Vietnam and began his combat service with the 8th PSYOPs Battalion in September of, eight, of 1968. While serving 12 months with the 8th Battalion, he was attached to the 3rd Battalion of the 173rd Airborne Brigade in the Lam Dung province of Vietnam. In January of 1969. He served as the lead and only Vietnamese translator in the 173rd, manager and interpreter of the Viet Cong defectors and North, Viet North Vietnamese defectors, and the NCO in charge of S5 PSYOPs and civilian affairs team. After serving in Vietnam from October of, 19, of 1968 to September of 1969, Sterling Grogan returned immediately to California and resumed his college career. He studied soil conservation at Cal Poly and shortly after started his own business, his own small international soil conservation consulting company. He retired in 2010 and lives with his wife, Ann Watkins, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So welcome, Mr. Grogan. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Glad to be here. <clears throat> so I'd first like to start out by asking you, uh, so the Vietnam War it started officially in 1954. So at that time, where were you in your life? And what was your family's initial reaction? What was your reaction? I was in elementary school. I had no, no knowledge or understanding of, of uh, any Vietnam War in 1954. In fact, of course, as you know, the Vietnam War started long before 1954. Uh, 1954 is when the French quit Vietnam. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I had no knowledge. My parents were strongly opposed to the uh, war. Okay. Interesting. Okay, so, you know, some years later, of course, you went to college. And so while in college, you joined the Peace Corps and you moved to Brazil. So what brought you to the Corps? And had you had any previous interest in this? Uh, or was this opportunity made new to you while you were in college? John F. Kennedy brought me to the Peace Corps. When he created the Peace Corps in 1961, uh, I got very excited because I had lived in Mexico. I spoke fluent Spanish and I wanted to go back to Latin America. And the Peace Corps seemed like a, an optimal way of doing that. So that's why I joined. <clears throat> okay. So you were in Brazil um, when your draft board ordered your return to the States. So tell me how you got your notice, please. And uh, tell me about the help that your Peace Corps supervisor attempted to supply. 
Well, my uh, uh, draft board sent the draft notice to my brother, Noel Grogan, who was living at that time in Del Mar, California. And he sent a telegram to me saying that he had received my draft notice and that I should return to the US. Uh, so I, uh, try, I called the uh, director of the Peace Corps, Jack Bond in Washington, DC, asked him to intervene on my behalf with my draft board in San Luis Obispo. He did so by telephone and then told me that uh, there was no hope that the, my draft board was angry with me. They claimed that being in the Peace Corps was avoiding my patriotic duty. Uh, just crazy, just crazy stuff. But that's an indication of how crazy everything associated with the Vietnam War was. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's, how, that's how I got drafted. I returned to the States, uh, to San Diego, tried to join the Navy, was unable to do that. So I uh, joined the Army uh, to avoid becoming cannon fodder as a draftee. I see. So out of, out of curiosity, did your brother ever receive a draft notice? Was he ever drafted? No, he was a Navy veteran. Oh, okay. He had been in the Navy uh, from 1955 to 58. I see. Okay. And so, so you mentioned that you came back to the States and you uh, originally tried to join the Navy. So why, why were you interested in joining the Navy and what was your hopes there? I had this romantic notion of becoming a frogman like your dad. So that's why I wanted to join the Navy, but uh, I was unable to, to do it there. The Navy was not accepting any more uh, people because they were full because from people who had received draft notices and did not want to become cannon fodder as draftees and uh, join the, you know, and try to join the Navy. It just, it wasn't possible. I see. <clears throat> so, okay. So, so once being recruited into the army, since the Navy wasn't an option, you obviously received basic training. So prior to joining the military, did you have any expectations of the military? And if so, how did basic training uh, agree or go against those expectations? Oh, my mother was uh, strongly opposed to me going into the military. She, she really hates the military. Uh, so that's really the only uh, understanding. Oh, actually, no, that's not true. My uncle, Sterling, uh, was a Navy officer in World War II. So I had some you know, minimal uh, exposure to military stuff through him. He taught me to shoot, for example, to shoot a pistol uh, when he came to visit us uh, in Pozo. And uh, he talked about his time with the, uh, he actually served, he was an American Naval officer who served with the French Navy uh, in World War II. So I had some understanding of the military, uh, but very limited. I see. So you went through several different trainings like AIT and uh, APC, and then you arrived at the Defense Language Institute. So, but yes. before going to the Defense Language Institute, you spent some time uh, learning how to drive APCs. Uh, could you share right, your experience? Yeah. Could you share your experience training with those? Right. One month at Fort Knox, Kentucky. It was fun. Uh, because uh, the APCs are uh, sort of like trucks, but they run on tracks rather than wheels. Uh, they have a big diesel, a big Dodge uh, diesel engine, uh, 300 horsepower, I think, something like that, P very powerful. And they're designed to carry an infantry squad, uh, eight, eight men with uh, combat gear. And they're designed to uh, counter Soviet forces in Germany. That's the whole purpose of an APC. Uh, they're also, uh, uh, what do you call it? amphibious. So that was fun. We got to drive across a lake. And then uh, the most fun was the uh, training for convoys in which the APCs travel at 40 miles an hour, 10 feet behind the one in front. So it's at night, no lights. Uh, so it was very exciting, <laughs> very thrilling, uh, probably very dangerous, but uh, still lots of fun. Let's see. And so you had that training, and I, and previously you had mentioned that um, you were almost sent to Germany. 
uh, right. to use those skills. Uh, yeah. So could you share that experience at the airport? And yeah. So you, know, you didn't want to uh, go. At the end of, yeah, at the end of APC driver uh, training, I was sent to Fort Dix, New Jersey, which is the embarkation point for troops for Army personnel going to Germany at that time. Uh, so it's 1967. And uh, I was in line uh, to get on an airplane to go to Germany when a master sergeant called my name and called me out of line and said, well, <clears throat> you got orders to Vietnamese language school. So you're not going to Germany after all. And it was a big relief because I had heard stories <clears throat> from other soldiers who had been in Germany about how horrible it was to be an APC driver in Germany because in the winter, because there are lots of ice, uh, lots of snow, and uh, APCs have a tendency, at that time anyway, they did, they had a tendency to lose a track. And so when you lose a track, the track comes off, you have to stop, you have to get out a jack, jack up the APC, put the track back on, and in Germany, you're doing this in the winter anyway, you do this in, with lots of ice, maybe in the snow or maybe in a freezing rain. So it was not, a, not an appealing prospect. And actually I was quite relieved to go to Vietnamese language school because it was in El Paso. <laughs> I see. It's quite a difference in weather. Yeah. <laughs> so, so speaking of Vietnamese uh, and the Vietnamese language school, so uh, how did you learn Vietnamese through the military? And was there something that prompted this choice? What brought you to learn a language through the military? Well, I, I asked for, uh, when I applied for Army Language School, I asked for Turkish, Russian, and Thai. And they gave me Vietnamese because there was a <laughs> war on, you know. Right. But anyway, uh, so how did we learn? Well, we used the um, Defense Language Institute's uh, audio lingual method, which is the same method used that I used uh, to learn Portuguese in the Peace Corps. Same exact method, which is uh, mostly we spend time, the students spend time in what's called a language laboratory with headphones, much like the ones you're wearing, uh, listening to tapes of Vietnamese native speakers and then repeating what we hear. So that was uh, six hours a day, five days a week. And then for two hours each day, we had uh, um, classroom sessions with a Vietnamese uh, teacher, uh, most of whom were from North Vietnam and uh, they were, they were uh, professors of one sort or another. Some language teachers, the, my favorite guy was a uh, history teacher and he was actually from Saigon. Interesting. Anyway, uh, so it's the audio lingual method. So it's, they teach you to speak the language first before you were taught to read and write. And I learned both because I was there for a whole year, 47 weeks. And uh, so I learned to speak and to understand and to read and write Vietnamese. Seems like a very comprehensive course. Yeah, it was. And out of curiosity, and Vietnamese, I'm sorry. Vietnamese is a tonal language, uh, unlike English. English is a sing has this, well, essentially a single tone. Vietnamese has five tones in the north and four tones in the south. So learning a, uh, a tone language is a serious challenge. I, I can imagine. So you spent quite a lot of time doing that. Um, out of curiosity, are you still fluent in Vietnamese today? No, I've lost it. Because when I came back from Vietnam, there were not very many Vietnamese people in America. And uh, then I moved to Farmington, New Mexico, small town in the Northwest, and there were no Vietnamese people there. So I had no one to practice with. I see. So I, I lost it. I lost my ability to speak. I understand. So, you know, while you were in uh, Vietnamese language school, you mentioned previously that there was a language teacher, teacher of yours that actually disappeared. Could you tell the story behind that? Yeah. One day we went to class in the morning and uh, I don't remember his name, but I'll call him Nguyen. Uh, oh, Nguyen, Mr. Nguyen was not in class. And uh, so we wondered what happened to Mr. Nguyen. And we had uh, 
oh, half a dozen army security agents in our class, in our language class. Uh, and uh, so they, they eventually found out that Mr. Nguyen had been taken away in the night because the army security agency had discovered that he had been taking pictures of us, the students, and sending them to somebody in Vietnam. We never, I never found out who he was sending uh, the pictures to. So I, I don't know any more about it than that, but it was kind of uh, strange that he so, just disappeared. Yeah. Now, did you, did you like his teaching? Did you like him as a teacher? Oh yeah, I liked all of the uh, Vietnamese teachers. They were all very nice. Uh, they were not afraid to talk about politics. And so they were very interesting. Uh, it, was a, it was a great uh, cultural introduction to a culture that, uh, you know, that I had no knowledge of before. Yeah. All right, so, so after your Vietnamese language training, um, you then later went to PSYOPs training and, and yeah, you were immediately, marked, immediately. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so then, so immediately after, so earlier you remarked when we talked previously, you said that the PSYOPs training you found to be very strange. Uh, how was it strange? And could you elaborate on some of the training that you had in PSYOPs? The best way I can describe uh, PSYOP training was, imagine this. Imagine your responsibility is to sell cigarettes in the United States. So in order to do the advertising and the promotion of cigarettes in the United States, you go to New York City and you recruit young men in their early 20s and you take them to Mexico City and you teach them uh, how to you teach them in Spanish. They may or may not understand Spanish, but you teach them in Spanish how to sell cigarettes in the United States. And then you send them back to the United States to sell cigarettes. That's the, the, uh, that's the best way I can explain it. It was very strange. Uh, we were supposed to be learning how to quote unquote, win the hearts and minds of the population in South Vietnam, which was ridiculous, ridiculous. It was just uh, a great example of how stupid the, uh, the military is uh, thinking that uh, teaching young <laughs> American kids uh, how to sell their government, their corrupt, venal, mercenary South Vietnamese government, how to sell that government to the population that knew exactly what the problems were with the South Vietnamese government. It was corrupt, it was stupid, it was venal, and it was dangerous. Uh, and it was Catholic, of course, uh, where, whereas the majority of the Vietnamese uh, population was Buddhist. So it was a really strange, really, really st strange thing. But, you know, as I told you, I mean, we got to see Triumph of the Will, that Nazi propaganda uh, film, which was uh, illegal. It was against the law to show that in America, but we got to see it. And, uh, and there were many things like that. I, I got to visit the library at uh, the John F. Kennedy Center for Special Warfare at Fort Bragg, where I, I bet your dad has been at Fort Bragg. Anyway, they have a wonderful library. And so I, uh, I visited the library and uh, they had two copies of an army report called Indigenous Tribes of the People of the uh, Republic of Vietnam, the South Vietnam. So I stole one of them and took it with me to Vietnam because it, it, uh, it taught me about the Montagnards, the hill tribes in uh, Vietnam, which were the, uh, the majority of the population that I was uh, exposed to. Very <clears throat> interesting. And, uh, I had a curiosity, do you still have that book? No. Okay. No, I, I, I don't know what happened to it. Okay. I've, I've uh, gotten rid of the thousands of books I once had. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, what were what were the credentials of your teachers in in psyops training? Where were they from? Oh, they were they were from New York. They were from the advertising industry in New York, and they were all Army reservists, uh, master sergeants, most of them. I don't know that we had. I think we had one commissioned officer, 
as a teacher, but the majority were master sergeants from the, the Army Reserve in New York. And they were from the advertising. They worked, their professional lives were in the advertising industry in New York. I see, interesting. So they were using the skills of uh, the advertising industry in, in teaching you psychological warfare. Yes. Interesting, very interesting. And so, so now you've received your PSYOPs training and uh, wh when you arrived in Vietnam, you were first directly with the 8th PSYOP Battalion. Uh, so right. when you were directly with them, what did your job entail working with them? Oh, well, I, I was assigned to what's called the Propaganda Development Center, uh, located in Yantran, Tran, uh, N-H-A-T-R-A-N-G, a beautiful seaside city, halfway up the coast between Saigon and Da Nang. Okay. Uh, anyway, so the Propaganda Development Center mostly uh, uh, developed leaflets, small pieces of paper about the size of a dollar bill. And the leaflets said various things like, for example, one that I wrote was a, a picture of the battleship New Jersey, which was at that time stationed off the coast of Vietnam, uh, bombarding so-called uh, communist positions, mostly along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Anyway, uh, so there's a picture of the battleship New Jersey. And I wrote in this, on this leaflet, this is the battleship New Jersey. It will rain death and destruction on you and your family if you don't leave the free fire zone. And uh, then another leaflet that we developed was a uh, uh, good conduct pass, safe conduct pass, I should say, safe conduct pass that uh, communist soldiers uh, could use, supposedly, to uh, avoid being killed when they surrendered to the American military. Many were killed anyway, because the military was so stupid about, about uh, that sort of thing. They killed, anybody who was a communist soldier, they just killed them outright. But that's what the army, that's what military does. They kill people and destroy property. That's, you can't, uh, can't give them any other jobs because that's all they know how to do. Uh, so uh, let's see. Yeah, those were the, those are two good examples of what we did in the Propaganda Development Center. I worked there for four months and then uh, I volunteered to be attached to the 3rd Battalion of the 173rd Airborne Brigade in the Central Highlands. So I left the coast, went up into the mountains, uh, into Lamdong province, uh, the southernmost province of the Central Highlands. Beautiful place. Interesting. So yeah, so you so you were attached uh, to the third battalion of the 173rd Air Brigade uh, in the Lamdong province. So while working with them, what was your job? Did it change? Um, and if so, yeah. oh yeah, it? it was totally different. It, okay. it, as I suspected it would be, I was the team leader, the NCO, the non-commissioned officer in charge of psyops and civil affairs, S5. And uh, so our job, we had actually two jobs. One was uh, we put together, actually, my predecessor, uh, Sergeant uh, Williams, I believe his name was. Uh, he was from Detroit, really nice guy. But anyway, he had created on a big sheet of plywood this loudspeaker system that could be just set on the, on the floor of a Huey helicopter. And uh, had, it, had, uh, it was a 2,000-watt uh, loudspeaker system, uh, four, four amplifiers, and two sets of speakers, woofers and tweeters. And uh, so we'd go up in the helicopter and we would talk to civilians on the ground, encouraging civilians to leave free fire zones. And then also we would talk to troops in contact. In other words, uh, where we'd find a firefight between Americans and communist soldiers. And we would circle around the firefight uh, and tell them in Vietnamese that uh, they should surrender because we're gonna kill them. The uh, speaking to the civilians on the ground was in the Montagnard language, Montagnard language, it was actually Koho, K-O-H-O. And so we hired a Montagnard to uh, interpret for us. 
And he, sp he actually did the speaking to people on the ground, most of whom he was related to. So that was, that was really interesting. And we did, I did uh, 55 missions like that, uh, essentially combat. And then uh, the other job we had was we had a pickup truck with a, a PSYOP van, and, which was just a big box that sat in the back of the truck. And in that box, we had a, a motion picture projector and all kinds of other stuff. And what we do is go to villages and show movies, mostly uh, Disney movies uh, with Vietnamese language soundtracks. And they were intended to uh, win the hearts and minds of the civilian population. Interesting. Well, so it seems like your job expanded. You had a lot more different things you were doing. Yeah. And it was a lot more dangerous. I can you imagine. You shot at regularly. So in your opinion, so you had to gather intelligence. As we spoke previously, you said you had to gather intelligence to know where the uh, enemy was so you could drop pamphlets from airplanes to reach them. Yes. Yeah. So in your opinion. They're actually, yeah, sorry. they're actually called leaflets. Leaflets. I'm sorry. Okay, leaflets. leaflets. A pamphlet has, has uh, more than one page. A leaflet has one page only. Okay. Thank you. Well, okay. uh, I'll call them yeah. leaflets. Uh, okay. so, so in your opinion, Army intelligence... Uh, you told me last time, you said that it was always inaccurate. Uh, why? And could you share one experience where you were requesting uh, inaccurate information on where the enemy was? Well, I, I, uh, uh, I learned through my uh, talks with the, with the battalion operations officer, Major Williams, um, and talking to other, other people. I learned that, and through talking with the recon, we had a recon company also, a uh, reconnaissance company. And uh, I learned that the problem with army intelligence was that they did not want to make a mistake. Uh, whatever, whatever that might mean, their principal objective was to not make any mistakes. So uh, when they got information from the recon company or from any other source, uh, it took them two weeks to make sure that they were not gonna make a mistake by telling us that the enemy was in X location. Uh, they were so conservative and so dumb about uh, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese, they did not want to make a mistake. So they didn't. And that meant that by the time their intelligence got to me, it was two weeks old and the, and the enemy had moved on. So, uh, Major Williams suggested to me one night that I should go talk to the CIA, which had an office in the uh, Bawak, the capital of Lamdong province, which was just a few kilometers away from our base. So I went to talk to the CIA and it turned out the CIA office was uh, a, they were the, they were, they were there to manage uh, Phoenix teams and Phoenix teams were teams of South Vietnamese uh, prisoners recruited from South Vietnamese prisoners, prisons uh, who were managed by the CIA to murder Vietnamese civilians who the CIA determined were so-called communist sympathizers. But the reason that I was sent to the CIA was that they were in daily contact, their assassination teams we're in daily contact with the Vietnamese or North Vietnamese. And so they knew exactly where the enemy was at any given day. Wow. So they, they uh, agreed to help me as long as I did not tell the army where I was getting my intelligence from. Because at that time, the CIA and the army were competitors for budget. And the army hated the CIA because the army felt that they were taking, the CIA was taking money from what they would like to do with it. Interesting. Can you hold on? Can you uh, pause for just a second? I need to go to the restroom. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'll be right back. Sure. <sighs> All right. We're going to pause the recording here and we will resume shortly. All right. We have resumed the interview. So 
Mr. Grogan, uh, I think previously when we talked last, you had mentioned a story where the, the only time you met a general, could you share that story? And what did he tell yeah. you? Yeah, so the uh, general was a one star and he was from the headquarters uh, of the 173rd Airborne Brigade. I don't know his exact position, but anyway, he came to see us, to visit us one day. And uh, he asked me what I was doing, what the PSYOPs and Civil Affairs was doing. And so I told him, and, and he said, how many leaflets are you dropping on the enemy? And I said, uh, a million every week. Uh, that was my job. Uh, I would give the coordinates of the target to the Air Force and they would drop the leaflets. Um, that was just the way things were done. He said, well, you need to drop, you need to increase that to 2 million uh, leaflets per week. And so I said, okay, yes, sir. Uh, that's what you do with the general. And uh, so then that's when I started uh, really digging into where the enemy is because this general wants me to drop a million more leaflets. It would make sense to me that I, I would drop them on the enemy. And uh, so that's when I discovered that the uh, uh, army intelligence did not know where the enemy was located. And that's when I wound up going to the CIA for that information. And I, from that point on, that was in the spring of 69. From that point on until I left in September, I used the uh, targeting information from the CIA. <clears throat> See. So speaking of the CIA, since we're back on that, the last time you shared an interesting trait um, of the man that opened the door to their outpost. You said that you looked at him and he looked uh, civilian except for one, one clothing item. Could you share uh, the, that, that experience? Well, all of the, all the CIA guys were uh, American military officers who were attached to the CIA. Uh, they all had buzz cut haircuts and so forth. And they all wore uh, military uniform shoes. And so they were easy to spot in a crowd. They wore civilian clothes, except uh, military uniform shoes. That was, uh, I guess that was their standard apparel, I don't know. And I must say that they were very nice to me. They were very kind and pleasant to me, unlike uh, most of the army uh, officers and senior NCOs who were just uh, crazy drunks. <clears throat> Uh, so I wanted to go back uh, to your, you, you explained earlier when you were talking about what you did with the 173rd, uh, you talked about how you flew in helicopters and you talked about how you played, uh, how you spoke in the loudspeakers. Previously, when we talked, you mentioned that you also played acid rock on the loudspeakers. Uh, so when you did this, what was the music used for? What was the intent, do you think? Oh, oh, the, the intent was just for our entertainment. It was... Uh between our base, when we were flying between our base and the target, wherever the target happened to be, that's when we, we would play the acid rock. Um, once we got to a target, then we switched and, and uh, played whatever the mission required. But uh, acid rock was the, the standard uh, thing we played on our way to and from missions. And um, the uh, uh, helicopter that I used, you asked me about the helicopter I used. The helicopter that I most often used was called, uh, it had painted on its front, the Surrealistic Pillow, which was the name of a Jefferson airplane album. Right. Uh, and I used that helicopter because it was usually assigned to what I considered, the, to the guy that I considered to be the best pilot. Uh, he was 19 years old, amazingly enough. Uh, he was a very skilled pilot, and unlike most of the pilots, he could actually read a topographical map. Wow. <laughs> uh, so uh, he, he was uh, very easy to work with, and uh, he was a great pilot. Do you, do you remember his name? No, I sure don't. That's unfortunate. Um, so, okay, so if I understand correctly, so this music you were playing, um, it was just, just like you would pop in earbuds and listen to music. It was, uh, for your, for your enjoyment, for your entertainment. Yes. Oh, okay. Now, did you play other music when you got to, uh, the firefight or did you switch on the loudspeakers and, and speak? No, the, okay. the missions always involved speaking okay. to, uh, 
to people on the ground. No, no, uh, no music. Interesting. So when we talked previously, you had mentioned that you kept in correspondence with your mother and brother while in combat, but more so your mother. So did this serve, this correspondence, this open correspondence, did it serve as a, as encouragement to you in combat or was it maybe a, more of a concern? Mm, both. I okay. think uh, my mother tried to be encouraging. She, she for example, she sent me a, uh, she, she signed up a subscription to Ramparts Magazine, which was the most anti-war magazine published in America at that time. Uh, so she sent me a, a subscription to that uh, as a morale booster, I suspect. Uh, I thought that was hilarious because it was so, because that magazine was so anti-war. Uh, but uh, she was concerned about me flying in helicopters. And so I tried to minimize what I told her about that part of my job and emphasize the, uh, the stuff I did uh, with the pickup truck. I see. Yeah, that's prob probably a little more safe. You're, you're breaking up. Sorry, would you say that that was a more safe, uh, going, going in the vans was more safe? Uh, yes, yes, because it wasn't in helicopters. Helicopters were extremely dangerous uh, and lots of guys died uh, in helicopters. I see. So, well, in, in that same vein, you had previously shared a time that when you actually were in your helicopter or in the helicopter you were flying in and you were ordered to fly back uh, to exchange with a commanding officer and his, uh, his executive officer. Could, could you share that story? Yeah, we, we were ordered uh, back before the end of our mission. We were at that time, as I recall, I could be, this could be inaccurate, but as I recall, we were uh, broadcasting over a firefight uh, <clears throat> with uh, uh, Viet Cong soldiers and, and American troops. And, but we were ordered back to the base. So we went back to the base, landed, uh, removed the loudspeaker from the helicopter and the helicopter uh, picked up the battalion commander, the executive officer, and I think two other people from the battalion commander's staff they took off and 10 minutes later, that helicopter crashed and all aboard were killed. <clears throat> I see. So obviously that must have had some impact. You, you know, you're learning of that incident. Um, and as you've said, yeah. those were unfortunately uh, common. So did incidents like this one you just described, uh, did, it, did it make you develop a, a method of obtaining good luck? Or was that even something that you uh, thought to do uh, how did you cope with the dangers of war? Well, I, I just, uh, I determined that I was going to survive and uh, flying around in helicopters was not uh, smart in that regard, but uh, I had, uh, I had considered that and I just told myself that I'm going to survive and I never, I don't think I ever thought about luck. Uh, I don't think that luck was a part of my thinking at that time. Um, I was just, uh, I was trying, I tried to be careful, but flying in helicopters was not being careful. I realized that, but it was also a lot of fun. And I really enjoyed that part. So, uh, so, so jamming out to acid rock in helicopters uh, named Surrealistic Pillow and trips into the jungle to play Disney movies aside, uh, you were also the impromptu manager of the 173rd Airborne Supply of, um, of Viet Cong defectors. So what did yeah. you do with these defectors? Uh, what, what jobs were they given? Well, they were scouts. Uh, okay. Their job was scout, infantry scouts. That was the, if you defect, if you were a communist soldier, Viet Cong or North Vietnamese Army, and you defected to uh, the Americans, you had two choices. You could either go to prison in South Vietnam, which was a death sentence, uh, you'd be murdered in, in uh, prison. There was a huge murder rate in South Vietnamese prison. Or alternatively, you could become a scout for the Americans. And if you became a scout for the Americans, the first thing you did 
uh, where she spent, I think it was three months in a so-called re-education camp in Saigon, where they tried to uh, make sure that you would not be a threat to the American soldiers. Okay, recording in progress. Uh, then I would go to Saigon and recruit guys, uh, either VC or North Vietnamese, to be scouts for the 173rd. Uh, and then I would take them back. And uh, all I ever did was encourage them uh, to be good scouts. And they were, uh, for the most part. One, we had one uh, Viet Cong soldier who tried to sabotage uh, some of the weapons that he was uh, given. Uh, Claymore mines, actually. Uh, but that was the only incident that I was aware of. All the rest of them, all the rest of, of the uh, defectors, they were called Hoi Chans, H-O-I-C-H-A-N-H, -H, uh, which means uh, those who return to the motherland. Um, anyway, uh, they were they were good good folks, good people. They hated the war. They just wanted to go back home and grow rice because they were all farmers. Uh, uh, so anyway, my job was just essentially to encourage them and to deal with uh, any kind of personal problems they had, uh, because as as I told you, I was the only person in the battalion who could speak Vietnamese. Yeah, that's pretty impactful. So speaking of the um, the Hoi Chin, oh, the Hoi Chan, sorry, um, you mentioned that you became quite close to one individual in that group. Uh, could you elaborate on your relationship and how? Uh, or maybe the conversations you had. Sergeant, that was Sergeant Van. Uh, and uh, I don't really remember a whole lot about him, but I do remember that we had great conversations about politics because, because he was very anti-war. Um, and he was not happy about being forced to become a communist because he was not a communist. He didn't think communism was a good deal at all. And he had great stories about the 14 times that he had traveled down the Ho Chi Minh Trail from North Vietnam to Saigon, uh, carrying ammunition or other supplies for the Viet Cong uh, who were surrounding uh, Saigon. Wow. And so you mentioned earlier that he, uh, like many others, he, he just wanted to go back to farming, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they were all farmers. Every you, one of them. Do you know what happened to them? So no. 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 I I, uh, I have heard. Uh, let's see. I spoke to a researcher at uh, UC Berkeley one time, and he said that most of those guys were executed by the communists when they took over South Vietnam. That's really unfortunate. Yeah. So the uh, the. The defector that you just spoke of, he was not the only person that you uh, got close to during your time in Vietnam. Uh, there was also a graduate from West Point that you mentioned. Um, yeah. And one time he, he talked to you about his opinion of the war and the military, and his expectations. Uh, could you elaborate on your conversation? Yeah, Major, Major Williams was the battalion executive officer for a while. And uh, he, uh, he was a West Point grad. Uh, he was very gung-ho initially upon uh, arriving in Vietnam, what he told me. And then uh, he saw how the army was managing the war, which he was, which was disgusting to him, stupid, uh, as he referred to it. And uh, as a result, he was so demoralized that uh, he told me that when he got back to the States, if he survived his uh, uh, deployment, um, that he would uh, resign his commission and become a civilian because he, he even though he, his dream had always been to be an army officer, he could not stand the way the army was prosecuting the war in Vietnam. Oh. And I lost track of him also. I see. So it uh, certainly had a profound impact on a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. Yes. I see. So if they did, how did these two individuals we just spoke of uh, impact your thoughts uh, on the war? Did they change them or simply reinforce them? Reinforce them. Okay. Yeah, both of them. Yeah. Let's see. That makes sense. It made, and actually, it made, they both uh, uh, contributed to me 
me becoming more and more cynical Seems. about the war. <clears throat> uh, cynical in what regard? That like it was impossible to win or that we shouldn't be there? In, in what regard? Yes. Can you elaborate? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was clear from about, oh, I would say four hours after I arrived in Vietnam, uh, at the beginning of my, of my one year tour, it was absolutely clear, abundantly clear that we had no business uh, being there because what was going on was a civil war. And uh, we had no business uh, operating in a civil war and we were doomed to failure as of course we did fail. Yeah. Uh, there was no possible way we could win uh, given the way the, the army, uh, the way the military managed our, uh, you know, our efforts. I see, yeah. Sorry. So, so actually, I wanted to ask, so when you were off duty, you, know, you used to go to a nearby town. And what did you do while you were there? And uh, how did this serve as a break from your life in combat? Well, uh, <clears throat> there was one restaurant in uh, Balloch, in the provincial capital, that was really good. And uh, so uh, I would go there, take, uh, take our pickup truck, and uh, as many guys as wanted wanted to could pile in the back and we would drive down to this restaurant and uh, uh, eat whatever they were offering. Most often it was dog uh, that they served, uh, but um, well, not always. Sometimes there, were, there was chicken, um, but usually it was dog. And uh, dog just tastes like beef, it doesn't, it's no different. Um, and uh, so that was a little bit of a break, a little bit of entertainment. And then we had a we had an e club and an enlisted club on the base. And if I was feeling really down, I could go and have a beer there. Uh, but usually, uh, what I would do is go to. There were a couple of places on the base compound where you could smoke dope and not get caught. And that's so that's usually what I did because there was a lot of a lot of marijuana. Uh, uh, everywhere in among American soldiers in Vietnam, and including me. I see. So, in remarks to the town, you you remarked on the enjoyable nature of the hour long walk in this town when you weren't driving. Uh, so you also had the choice of riding an Air Force bus on occasion, if I remember correctly. Uh, there was, however, a downside you mentioned to this transportation option. Could you elaborate on right. the dangers of riding the well, Air Force bus? That, so this was in Nha Trang. This was not in the Central Highlands. This was at my first duty station in Nha Trang. Uh, the Air Force ran a, a bus from our base, which was at the airport, uh, into town. Uh, a blue, it was like a school bus, except it was painted blue. But the uh, Viet Cong uh, caught on to this and they would toss hand grenades into the buses every once in a while and kill guys. And uh, so then the Air Force put screens on the windows, but uh, still there was a problem because whenever the bus came to a stop, like at an intersection or to let people on or off, uh, they would open the doors, and if there happened to be a VC nearby, he would toss a grenade in through the door. So it was still dangerous, um, and that encouraged us to walk to town, walk the hour uh, to and from uh, town, rather than ride the Air Force bus. I see. Now, were there dangers walking? or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm sure there were. I never had uh, any problem. Uh, walking, uh, never, uh, never encouraged any assaults or anything like that. But uh, I he heard stories of other guys that had been assaulted uh, walking into town, wow. but it so, never happened to me. And then while you were driving in your own pickup truck, did there, was there ever a time or was that pretty safe? Oh yeah. Well, one time uh, we were shot at multiple times in the in the truck this is back in the central highlands now okay. um 
and uh, but I never, you know, I never got hit. And uh, when we were fired on, I would just go f- drive faster and get away from, you know, whoever was firing on us. Uh, and nobody on my team was ever injured. Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe because we were always stoned. When we, when we uh, went anywhere in the pickup truck, we'd get stoned first. And, um, and that, maybe that protected us, who knows? Yeah, maybe that was your um, good luck. Could be. All right. So overall, um, how did you view the overall effectiveness of the 173rd Airborne Brigade? Uh, How did you see the entire Army's effectiveness in Vietnam? Well, uh, I I viewed, see, I was exposed to the 173rd uh, and I was exposed to the 8th PSYOP Battalion. Uh, and I was also exposed to what's called MACB, which was the CIA's, uh, actually the CIA was CORDS, but they ran MACB too. MACB was the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, and it was called, it was, for short, it was abbreviated MACV, M-A-C-V. Uh, that was the overall military uh, part of the effort, and then uh, CORDS, C-O-R-D-S, Civilian Operations and Revolutionary Development Support. That was the CIA's part of the effort. And because I was in PSYOPs, I was uh, under the control of both of those entities. And for example, every month I had to go to Saigon for a meeting of the country propaganda team, which was a CIA effort. And, uh, and then of course, I'd, you know, I would come back and be with the 173rd. So what I observed was a, a colossal uh, ignorance on both the, on the part of both the military and the CIA. The CIA knew better, but uh, to protect their budget, I guess, I don't really know why. Uh, they kept prosecuting the war as Congress told them to and the, and the president told them to. But what I observed was we were colossally ignorant about the war. We were very ignorant of the culture. We did not understand or believe what civilians told us about the corruption and venality of the South Vietnamese government. Uh, They were our allies. And so we were obliged to support them even though uh, there was no possible hope of uh, winning the war. Um, So what I observed was just colossal ignorance, lots of lying, Um, the lying was endemic. Uh, No matter who you talk to in leadership, either in Cords or MACV, uh, usually what you'd get was a lie of one sort or another. Uh, So uh, it was was a hopeless, uh, it was hopeless nonsense from the very beginning. And the discouraging thing to me was I read uh, Bernard Fall's books. Hopefully you have read them as well. he was a French journalist uh, who was with the uh, French Terry in 1954 when they lost at Bien Bien Phu. Uh, and he had been in Vietnam for many years before that. Uh, and it, it was absolutely clear. The French were just as stupid, just as ignorant as we were. Or I should say, we were just as ignorant as the French were, even though the French had been there for a long time, uh, you know, essentially 100 years. Uh, it had been a Vietnam had been a, a French colony, and uh, you know, with an interruption during the Second World War when Japan kicked the French out for a few years, but then the French came back, and we supported the French. That's why I said that the the war in Vietnam did not start in 1954. For the U.S., it began uh, in 1941, actually, uh, when the, the first uh, uh, U.S. military assistance went to uh, uh, the French went to help the French. Right. So you had met you, you just mentioned that, um, well, that you saw that the army was largely uh, unprepared to understand the culture and adapt to that. And in that same vein, uh, I think you had previously mentioned that there was a perfect example of that simply in the nature of the way the 173rd was set up, the ratio um, 
of culturally uh, understanding people like yourself and uh, a different kind of group of people. Could you elaborate on the differences you saw there? Here's the here's the the best example of that. So I had a, a little tiny office about uh, 10 feet by 10 feet um, at the base uh, of the 173rd, third battalion of the 173rd. That was my office. And that's where I kept uh, supplies for our pickup truck excursions. Uh, that's where we kept the loudspeakers, uh, the loudspeaker uh, on the plywood, on the piece of plywood. And I had a little bookshelf above my desk. And in that bookshelf, I included that big, thick army report on the indigenous peoples of, uh, of uh, South Vietnam. Uh, it was a great, or a really interesting study done by American University uh, anthropologists. So it was an, it's a, essentially an anthropologist view of South Vietnam, of the hill tribes of South Vietnam, which is where we were. Right. And uh, one day, uh, I was shocked to uh, knock, there was a knock on my door, on the door of my office, and the battalion commander came in, a colonel. Uh, I was really blown away that the colonel would come to see me. I was just a lowly sergeant. Anyway, he was very polite, uh, and he had just arrived. Hmm. I think he had been there maybe a week at that point. Uh, and uh, so he said, so how are things going? Uh, you know, he was trying to be friendly. And uh, he looked at my bookshelf and he said, where did you get that? I said, I stole it from the library at Fort Bragg. And uh, so he pulled it off the, off the uh, shelf and leafed through it. And he said, boy, this would have been really helpful. I, I've never seen this. Um, uh, I said, so sir, can I ask you what kind of orientation did you receive to Vietnam before you came here to be our battalion commander? And he said, none, N-O-N-E, no orientation, no language training, no cultural training, nothing. Uh, and uh, I said, well, that, it must be a real shock to be here. He said, yeah. I said, what, so what did you do at West Point? He said he had come from West Point. He said, well, I taught Portuguese. And I said, really? You're a Portuguese language teacher? And you've come to be our battalion commander? He said, yeah, that's right. That's the way the army is. And so I greeted him in Portuguese. And he was so shocked. He couldn't believe that I could speak Portuguese. And he didn't speak very good Portuguese. He had an <laughs> academic uh, understanding of Portuguese. Yeah. Uh, but then he, he said, well, carry on. So he turned around and, and uh, walked out. Wow. But uh, that told me a lot about the way the army managed Vietnam because, uh, and, and, and the other one I was gonna tell you about, you need to read the book, if you wanna pursue this, you need to sure. uh, read a book called About Face. Have you ever heard of the book About Face? No, I haven't. It's, it's uh, like okay. the word about, A-B-O-U-T? Yes. And then face about at, face. Okay. It's a it's the command to turn around. The army command to turn around. About face. And okay. uh, so the book about face is uh, written by a colonel uh, after he left uh, Vietnam. And I don't remember his name. I, it's on the top, right on the tip of my tongue, but I can't remember right now. But anyway, he actually served for a year at the headquarters of the 173rd Air Airborne Brigade. And it's fascinating. It's a fascinating book. He was totally devoted. He was a, I don't think he was a West Point graduate, uh, but he was totally devoted to the army, totally devoted to the cause of the war in Vietnam. And uh, by the time his, I think he was, he did three one year tours there. By the time his third tour was up, he was thoroughly disgusted with the army and with the civilian leadership. So here it is, about face, David H. Hackworth. There you go. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, yeah but Dave, uh, yeah, Dave's niece was my student at the University of New Mexico. And so he came to visit her one time and we had coffee uh, at UNM. And by that time he'd been living in Australia 
really nice guy, uh, but he was so disturbed by what he had seen in Vietnam that he was really reluctant to talk very much about it. Uh, he just kept saying, well, read my book and you'll understand. So if you want to understand the reality of, of the army in Vietnam, you should read about face. Uh, sure. But, um, Oh, let's see, what else? Uh, what else was I going to mention to you? Uh, oh, I know. Um, when I got home, 1969, when I landed back in California, uh, one of the first things I did was I contacted the University of California uh, at Berkeley. They have a thing called the, ooh, what was the name of it? Something like the Vietnam correspondence center or something like that. And it had been set up in the early days of the war, I think in the 1960s, in the early 1960s, okay. to gather documents about the war. And I saw the director uh, there, who was a very famous uh, historian and anthropologist, and also a newspaper. Uh, he had been a journalist and had spent many years in Vietnam during the war. And he said that, that I asked him why the army was so inept and so incompetent. And he said that after Tet, Tet was in February of 1968, uh, Vietnamese New Year, when uh, he said after Tet, the American army realized, the leadership realized, even though the politicians would never admit it, the le army leadership in 1968 after Tet realized that we would never win the war. And so from that point on, the leadership of the army was totally demoralized and uh, they were unable to uh, and unwilling uh, to do anything more than just uh, stay in place. There was no hope of winning the war and the leadership, the, the military leadership knew it, but they kept lying to uh, Congress and to the public. Uh, so very interesting. Yeah, I think that proves on a much larger scale. Uh, that even in the leaders of the war, uh, that they themselves were demoralized. That's, wow, that, that's impactful. Yes, yes. And, and I think maybe another example we talked about previously might have been uh, just just the way the 173rd uh, was set up. You mentioned that there were 800 some odd men in that, uh, at least in your battalion, right? And out of them, you were- yes. Eight hundred and thirty-five. Yes. Okay. And uh, could could any of the could anyone else speak Vietnamese? No. No, I was the only one. <clears throat> did you ever see example? Like, did you ever see an example where, uh, where there was a conflict, and maybe in some in some way or another, where them having known Vietnamese would have made things easier, more or more streamlined? Oh God! Every day. Okay. Every day. Yes. One of the reasons they could never find the enemy was they had, they had no idea how the enemy operated. They had no idea how, to, how the enemy worked. Um, the Viet Cong and the North, Viet, the North Vietnamese Army had a very sophisticated communications program. Communications strategy it was very simple. Uh, it relied on, uh, on civilians uh, uh, forwarding messages. It relied on uh, some radio communications. They, had, they did have radio communications, which we often were able to interrupt, uh, but they had a very sophisticated um, uh, vocabulary that they used for military operations. We learned that vocabulary in language training. So I knew, their, I knew that, I knew that vocabulary, but nobody else in the battalion knew it. And I was not uh, one of the, I was not a grunt. I was not an infantry soldier. Right. Uh, I was a, what do you, I guess you would call it a consultant. And uh, they didn't, uh, the, the leadership of the uh, 3rd Battalion of the 173rd, they did not take uh, PSYOPs and civil affairs seriously at all. They didn't care about it. Um, right. It was irrelevant to them. And uh, when I pointed out to, to Major Williams, for example, one evening uh, when we were on, uh, on duty at the Tactical Operations Center, uh, when I pointed out to him that, that we could hear the, uh, some North Vietnamese unit talking on the radio, 
And I told him what they were saying. And he said, how do you know that? And I said, <laughs> well, I, you know, I learned this vocabulary in language school. And he said, whoa, he said, that's amazing. He said, you should be out with the, you know, with the grunts. And I said, well, I'm a consultant. You know, if you ask me to do it, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, but uh, it's not my job. And uh, so it was, it was that kind of thing uh, that was just constant. It was every day there was a new example of the, you know, the, the army was essentially blind. Um, I mean, I, as I like to say, 835 trained killers in the battalion, six helicopters with, along with a maintenance facility, an artil artillery uh, battery of, I think we had two or three howitzers and a half a dozen mortars. We had all of this equipment. We had, uh, you know, the most sophisticated uh, uh, night vision available at the time, and yet we couldn't find the enemy. I mean, it was just ridiculous, just yeah. ridiculous. No excuse, in my opinion. See, it seemed like a very sophisticated uh, unit, very sophisticated, sophisticated group. Now, um, historically, yes. historically, uh, what what a hist what historical individual uh, did this did this uh, brigade originally belong to? Uh, General William Westmoreland, who for four and a half years was the commander in chief of uh, of the army in Vietnam. Right. He had he had uh, helped form the 173rd Airborne Brigade. Uh, I think it was either in the Korean War or shortly after it. Interesting. I did not know that. Thank you for sharing. And and even worse, I mean, you know, worse than the blindness of uh, of the army of that unit to Vietnam to where they were, uh, it was essentially a segregated unit. Uh, most almost all of the officers were white. Almost, I think, all of the senior non commissioned officers were white. And most of the grunts were black. Oh, I see. So that's that. That ties directly to a lot of things that people are uncovering or coming out with uh, nowadays and explaining that um, <clears throat> it was there was almost a class war going on right back home. Uh, yes. Yeah. Interesting. And you could see you could see the direct uh, effects of that right there on the front lines. Interesting. Yes. So uh, before we move into our closing here, uh, are there any other uh, stories, anything that you'd like to share about your time in Vietnam? It was a waste. I think, I think the army took, stole three years of my life, uh, including the, the year I was in Vietnam. A complete waste. Uh, had no no positive, uh, nothing positive about it at all. But do you think that the negative experiences? Um, I mean, people say that there's always a silver, silver lining in everything. Do you think that you have found one, or do you think it's possible to find one in anything that happened in Vietnam or your experience in the, no. in the military? No. No. Okay. Absolutely not. Nope. Nothing positive. Okay. It was a it was a a war uh, where American combat soldiers uh, were introduced based on a lie that the Navy told about the Maddox and the Turner Joy, uh, and it never got any better. The lying never stopped, and the incompetence just grew. I see. Yeah, I understand. Well. Uh, your your time came to a close, fortunately for you, and you were mustered out at the uh, no longer active Oakland Army Depot in California. Uh, you resumed your college career. So in summary, in general, what did you do with your life uh, from then on? Well, I tried to forget about the war. I tried to forget about Vietnam, and I'm sure that contributed to my uh, losing the language ability. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I graduated from Cal Poly and, and then uh, immediately got a master's degree uh, in soils. I graduated in political science, got my bachelor's in political science and then immediately got my master's in soils uh, at Cal Poly, uh, came to New Mexico. Actually, I didn't immediately 
uh, start my consulting business, I actually went to work for a mining company, restoring uh, strip mined land on the Navajo reservation. And that was fascinating. Did that for 14 years. And then I quit and went back to college at the University of New Mexico, got my master's in ecology and started my consulting business. And in the consulting business, I worked, uh, uh, I worked in Chile, Brazil, uh, Venezuela, uh, and uh, Tajikistan, uh, and as well as uh, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Texas, uh, uh, Kentucky, and West Virginia. Uh, and, and the work I was doing was, you know, I really enjoyed it because it was good work. It was environmental restoration, ecological, it's, called, it's now called ecological restoration. It made me feel good, uh, made me feel like I was contributing something positive to society, which <coughs> was a big contrast to being in the army, which I thought was destructive of society. I see. Interesting. Well, Previously, you shared um, that you later joined Veterans for Peace, if I remember correctly. Yes. Okay. Yes, in Florida. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, while you were there, um, could you could you share uh, the experience that you think earned you a file in the annals of the COINTEL FBI database? Well, it was uh, 19, uh, let's see, by the time I got to Florida, it was the end of 1969 early 1970, I was working at the, at the uh, Latin American Library at the University of Florida. And uh, uh, I joined Vets for Peace. One of the graduate students in history, in Latin American history, uh, became a friend. And he was the leader of the Vets for Peace. He had been a, an Air Force uh, enlisted man in Vietnam. And uh, so we, we organized marches, we organized demonstrations, uh, we occupied the office of the president of the university for one day. Uh, and about, oh, I don't know, maybe our third march that we had organized, uh, there was a, a group of uh, clearly FBI uh, agents uh, once again, they're dressed in dark suits with dark ties, white shirts, and military uniform shoes. Uh, and they had cameras. They had uh, motion picture cameras. So they took uh, film of our demonstrations. And, and from that point on, uh, every time we did a demonstration, there would be these FBI guys uh, taking motion pictures of the demonstrations. They never, uh, they never beat us up. Uh, one time, the local cops got a little rambunctious with some of the demonstrators, uh, uh, beating them with sticks. Uh, but uh, it was not not a big deal. Uh, so I I just assume, based on that, that uh, on that experience with the FBI, that I have a COINTELPRO uh, file because, as we learned later, COINTELPRO was a very high priority of J. Edgar Hoover. And he was still in charge of the FBI at that time. Right. True. Yes. <clears throat> so coming to a close here, uh, in summary and in reflection, so for future generations, uh, what would you personally like to impart on them about your, uh, about your Vietnam War experience? Uh, maybe, maybe some words of wisdom. Um, something that's really important for them to understand about the war and understand about your experience. Our country is, uh, is a violent country. It's been a violent country since, it's found, since before its founding. Uh, the British were violent uh, when they were our, colon, our colonizers and we've continued to be violent. <clears throat> about every 20 years, there's a, some kind of war uh, that we get involved in. And what I would suggest to uh, uh, people who read your story uh, is that uh, uh, the one thing you can always be assured of when the United States goes to war, and that is that the government, the, the politicians are lying to you, and the, the military is lying to the politicians, and the politicians are lying to the, to the civilians. 
That's just a fact of life. Uh, if you don't believe, if, if a person doesn't believe that that is the case in Iraq or Afghanistan, I would uh, strongly recommend reading the thousands of pages of uh, reports that document the lying that has gone on about Iraq and Afghanistan before, during, and after US involvement in those countries. Um, and it's still going on. It's still going on now. We have combat troops in Syria um, and in Yemen and in Djibouti uh, and in some 80 some countries, other countries uh, around the world. Uh, the lying continues, it has never stopped and I don't think it ever will stop. So when, uh, when you as a civilian are asked to support the, government's, uh, the government going to war, just remember that you're being lied to. That's, the, that's my message. Thank you. Your message is heard mm -hmm. and is received. Thank you for your time and thank you for your consideration and sharing uh, your important stories. Well, thank you, uh, Liam. It's uh, great that you're doing this. Hey, and could I get a copy of, of uh, your final product? Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay, I, certainly. I will, I'll get and that to either, you. Uh, either email or snail mail, fine for me. Okay? Okay. Wonderful. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. Sure.